It's Hey, hey, it's Conrad Thompson, and you're listening to Grilling JR with the voice of wrestling, Mr. Jim Ross. Jim, how are you, man? I'm good, Conrad. All over the country this week, and uh, happy to be doing it. All I'm over North ex- America, Daddy. Last night, you made your <laughs> AEW Canadian debut. How about that, man? Toronto's it's, always a good time, isn't it? Sure. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, fans are great. Great. Canadian fans, are, they've been waiting a long time. And so sometimes that anticipation builds for a great audience. And I think we prove that, uh, so it's good. I'm glad we're, I'm glad we're doing it. I'm glad this shows that we're growing and I, I, I love that growth and those opportunities that those, that growth, uh, produces. So all good, man. It's good. Life is good. We're getting all of our roster back in AEW healthy again. That helps a hell of a lot, you know, uh, trying to book a TV show or two TV shows with uh, less than half of your main event roster available for a good length of time here lately. It's tough. It's tough for Tony Khan to book something like that. And, uh, you know, but he's got some good guys around him and, and, uh, you know, Jericho is doing a great job and, uh, we've got leaders like, uh, Brian Danielson and, and, uh, John Moxley just signed a new five year deal, which I think is very stabilizing for our roster. He's our top guy. He's a champ. And, uh, so he's emotionally invested. You sign a five-year deal, new one at his age, you're, you're, you're invested. So I'm, I'm really happy to see that happen. Well, we're excited that we're going to be talking about, uh, everything. And I mean, everything today it's ask Jr. anything. Of course, we're on the heels of a big AEW show last night in Canada. And, uh, man, I can't believe this is here, but Jim, this weekend, this Saturday, it's more than just football Saturday. And you know. Me and Jeff Jarrett are going to be at each other's next because Tennessee thinks they're good this year. We'll find out yeah. on Saturday. Uh, I think, I think they are pretty good. Wow. Well, are they better than Alabama? I'm not saying that, Yeah, but I think they're better than Tennessee has been, uh, in the last several years. And it just goes to show you what happens when you get some stability in your coaching staff and you are recruiting well and Tennessee's recruiting well and Heifel's doing a nice job there, but are they better than Alabama? No. But will Alabama get the best shot? Oh, hell yeah. It'll be a slobber knocker to say the least. I'm fired up about it. And then Saturday night, I can't believe this is real, Jim. I'm going to be in Mexico for my first ever triple mania. I've, I've been to wrestle kingdom. I've been to WrestleMania. I've never been to a triple mania. I'm not sure what to expect, man. This will be fun. Have you ever been to a Lucha show in Mexico city? Uh, no, we did a raw there one time in Mexico city. Cause I was, I, I was actually in the ring which is scary to think of again, reconjure that uh, memory. It was John Cena and myself versus, uh, uh, what's what was the kid's name? Uh, hell of a Mexican athlete. We had him, uh, uh, Alberto Del Rio. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Alberto and, uh, Michael Cole took on John Cena and a good old JR. That's my only experience there. I went down there to, uh, announce the signing of, uh, uh, I think, uh, one of the, one of the mass guys we signed it's really good. It gave me a lot of expectations. Didn't live up to it quite, but, uh, in any event, uh, I have got a lot of experience. It'll be very festive and I'm sure you'll have a hell of a lot of fun. And you got a chance to eat good food if you choose to. Oh yeah. Well, I'm going to, you know that. And, and I hope you guys will join me. If you're not able to, uh, to make the show in Mexico city, it might be sold out. You can certainly watch anywhere in the world on demand live and in HD on a little app called fight. Jim, you're pretty familiar with fight. I actually yeah. first got into new Japan because you did color, uh, right. for wrestle kingdom. And man, I was like, well, I'll know the stories now I'm in. It was fantastic. And, and I think a lot of fans are going to try triple mania for the very first time, uh, this weekend Why not? at watch triple mania.com is where you can check it out. Uh, Saturday go. night, watch triple And of course today we're thankful that you guys sent in a ton of questions, Jim, there's no way we'll get to all of these, but there's going to be some fun ones in here. Well, uh, it's like a steer steer can only try. There you go. So let's, let's try to get through as many as we can to these nice folks. Uh, Riju wants to know, have you been paying attention to WWE lately? How do you think triple H has done in his job 
since taking over for Vince. I think he's doing a great job. Triple H pronoun boy. Uh, I think we I think he's doing fine. And, uh, just resetting the deck and getting his players in positions he wants them to be in. So I think he's doing a good job. It's not an easy job and it's a thankless job by and large, but he's getting some free passes because he's new. And I think he's the right guy for the job. Uh, friend of the show, Mel Coleman made a fantastic drawing a few weeks ago and he tweets it at us to make sure that you've seen it. Did you see where someone drew you as Max Caster? So you've got the uh-huh. microphone, you're dressed up like a rapper. I think I did. You got the I cowboy hat on. It's yeah. pretty funny. Listen, <laughs> listen, <laughs> what, what yeah, do you, kid, go ahead, what I'm do you sorry. make of the acclaimed getting over the way they have, man? It's been oh, a, su- pleasantly surprised. Yeah. What a story. Pleasantly surprised. They've gotten over. They're two good kids. Uh, they have the right attitude. They're, they're valuable assets to AEW. And, uh, you know, they got themselves over just as simple as that. They got over and, uh, how they got over and all that stuff is, you know, is there to be discussed, but, uh, I'm, I'm happy for them. good kids and they got a great future. So there's no doubt. Yeah. You're going to be leading any scissor me daddy chance anytime soon, or are you going to leave that for the kids? I'll probably leave it for the kids, but don't, I'm not going to tell you that I'm against it. Oh, hey, no. it works. It works, you know, and, and they're selling merch and the fans are reacting to it. It's, it's pretty amazing. Uh, it's, it's amazing to me that, and it's amazing to me what gets over. Yeah. You know, uh, you know, six months ago, if you said, well, here's this, here's a scissor thing and we're going to, we're going to build on it. I said, well, you're crazy. It's not going to, that's not going to work. This goes to show you, you never know exactly what's going to get over. And certainly the scissor me campaign has gotten over. There's probably some lessons in there from a lot of guys who've done some really interesting stuff. Like Jericho got a scarf over Jericho got a list over, uh, the the Jericho had a mimosa match. And listen, in hindsight, some of these ideas, we might say, well, now that was kind of silly, but at the (laughs) time, boy, the audience was eating it up and they're loving scissor me daddy right now. It's like the new hot thing. It's like a modern DX suck it or whatever. It's crazy. It is same basic, uh, presentation it's trendy and it's right now it's working i just my only suggestion they claim is keep it going man absolutely keep right. it rolling you got some momentum you're you're over the hump now just make your game in ring better and these two kids are good athletes so uh i'm uh you know bowens is a hell of a ball player in college and uh he i thought he has done some nice work it obviously because of the rhyming and uh, the verbal mm-hmm. skills uh Max Castor gets a lot of the, a lot of the love, shall we say, but I, I like, uh, I, I like this team a lot. They're, they're one of my favorite. I don't know if I have more favorite team in wrestling right now than the acclaim to me. They're the best. It's super fun to watch. Super entertainment, maximizing their minutes as a friend of ours would say. Yeah. I heard that. Uh, Josh Rosenbaum, coach Rosie wants to know Jr. What's your worst experience at a football game? Well, if I'd have been in Dallas on Saturday, that would probably rank number one, getting your ass beat <laughs> like a government mule, uh, 49 to nothing by your arch rival, the Longhorns. Uh, that would be that, that, that watching that game by myself here, I got back from, uh, where the hell were we last week? Uh, Washington, DC, I think it was wherever, <laughs> wherever we were last week. Uh, I, uh, got home in time to watch. I got home about 30 minutes before the game started. So I got to see all the game. I wish I hadn't, I would have had a problem with it. If I'd known the score was going to be what it was, I wouldn't, I would have prayed for a plane delay, uh, but it didn't happen. <laughs> I didn't watch it all. So uh, Saturday was a pretty good example that we got humiliated. Yeah. And, uh, so but in person, I guess, uh, one of those would have to be, uh, Losing in the national championship game three or four times, you know, uh, we just didn't, we just didn't get it done. And, but again, you know, you got to build the positives. It's a great institution. They got great tradition. They won a lot of national titles. We've got a great head coach. You might not believe that, that, but I, I believe it. That's, that's my take on it. I'm still my story, Connie. I'm sticking to it. Damn it. I love it. <laughs> 
Well, here's one. Uh, this one comes to us from, uh, Zoe Lopez. And he wants to know, I recently got my hands on some of JR's Chipotle ketchup. What uh, would JR recommend pairing it with meat wise? Oh, you know, I've, uh, it's great. And uh, as you would use any ketchup, meatloaf, things like that, uh, it's perfect. I like to warm it up in a little bowl, maybe 20, 30, 35 seconds, something like that. Just get it nice and warm. It makes a great steak sauce. So if you want it, you're looking for a new steak sauce or something that's a little different, a little different flavor profile, uh, the ketchup might be one of them. It makes great meatloaf. I made something this week uh, when I got home. It's a nice thing when you got this stuff in your pantry and you just go pull it out of the pantry and start squirting it and getting the, what the hell I'm not doing. Uh, but, you know, I, I think the, those national title losses were a bitch, especially when we should have won at least one of those games, I think. <laughs> my take on it. I love you, Jim. Uh, here's one from, uh, Dan. He wants to know, Jim, do you miss doing play by play for football? And would you go back to doing it? If I ever offered the chance? Well, I, if it meant leaving AEW, the answer would be emphatically. No, right. I, I like what I'm doing. Uh, but would I, would it be fun to be in a booth or a game? Sure. Yeah, I'm a football fan and I'm a broadcaster. So I think it all goes hand in hand, but bottom line is, is that, uh, I, I have my perfect job right now and I'm excited that, and, I, and I appreciate the things that the people are saying about rampage. You know, we're trying to again build that brand Friday night's a daunting night for any TV programming. And, uh, but we got, we got work to do, but, uh, I thought our last two or three shows on rampage had been solid as hell. Here's one from, uh. Michael, he wants to know what are JR's thoughts on how Jalen Hurts is doing this year for the Eagles, and does he think he has a great shot of leading the team to the Super Bowl? Absolutely, he's got a shot at it because they've got a great offensive line. They got a strong defense. Speaking of the Eagles, pronoun boy, and uh, uh, you know he's a hell of an athlete. When he, he was at OU one year, yeah, and and had a great year. Uh, but when you're around him and you see how big he is, this cat ain't no lightweight. No. He's jacked. He's like a tailback. He, I told you one time, he reminded me of Billy, uh, Billy Sims. I said, or maybe even Adrian, because he's so big and strong. Uh, he's poses unique challenges to defenses to, to, to prepare for, but, uh, he's a great guy. Good kid. Dad is a coach. He's football background. Uh, so I think uh, he's got a shot at taking the Eagles. If they stay healthy and he stays healthy. Uh, there's no telling how far they can go. They believe they're really good and they are they're the only undefeated team in the, in the league, right? Uh, yeah. The Eagles. Yeah. So I, I'm a, I'm a Jalen hurts fan, just to be honest with you. And I, I like his character and he's not showing his ass. He's not being an idiot. I was surprised the other day he scored a touchdown this past weekend and he danced. I don't think I'd ever seen him dance before. You might want to stick with the quarterbacking, but the, the dancing was a fun little treat, I guess, but he's a good player. Conrad, he's a good player. And, and, uh, uh, second round pick, I think or third. So he's the, he's the, he's the real deal. And when you got the real deal at quarterback underscore quarterback, uh, you can accomplish a lot of things. Chats Jonesy on Twitter wants to know, what are your memories of pitching a match on Alcatraz Island between mankind and undertaker? I never heard that before. Is that a JR idea? That's a fun idea. Yeah, yeah it's an idea. I just thought it, well, you know, we've done, we kept looking for s scenes, kept looking for settings, uh, on, uh, during that, uh, undertaker mankind scenario, we knew the marriage worked. We knew those guys like working together. So I was just trying to come up with a site that, uh, we could utilize that was different. You know, how many times can you go in the boiler room? How many times can you go in the hell in a cell? You know, they, they like that kind of stuff. And so I thought, well having a match, uh, in Alcatraz where the, the doors would open at a certain time and they would be looking for each other and all that stuff. I thought had some intrigue. It would sort of be a unique setting to say the very least. It just never, the, the odd, there's so much red tape, much to my chagrin that it just didn't, it wasn't going to work out. I'm sure other movie, uh, producers and stuff like that had tried to get into Alcatraz. 
Well, wasn't you know, easy. WCW wound up doing some skits in there with Piper the next year. Right. So you were pitching right. this in 96, I suppose, or I would guess. And yeah, February probably. of 97, I think is when we see, uh, those, those vignettes with Roddy Piper there. So great minds. Think alike. It was right? an idea. It was a, it was a decent idea if we, but to get all the equipment in to do a shoot uh, where you got multiple cameras and you're being able to follow the action appropriately, uh, it just started mounting too much. Uh, n- another, you gotta go through another, uh, uh, bureaucracy, shall we say, and it's a Alcatraz is a big tourist attraction. So getting all that put together was, uh, uh unfortunately insurmountable. Now then, so having said all that, I don't think the idea is dead somewhere along the way. Somebody's going to do a match in Alcatraz and it's going to do well because curiosity factor is going to be overwhelming. Uh, that's a great idea. I'm really surprised we haven't seen it already. David Alonzo wants to know, have you had any moments in the booth when you just didn't know what to say? Well, I tried not to, obviously, uh, here's what happens in that kind of a deal. Conrad, it's a good question is that, uh, uh, you just lay out this re- announcers believe that laying out is a sign of weakness, apparently, because it's, we feel compelled and I'm just as guilty as anybody to continue to talk through things and, and to keep talking. And quite frankly, sometimes laying out is your best broadcast lay out a little bit, let it soak in, let it, let it, let the audience process what they've just seen or what you're teasing them to talk, to think about. So I don't think I've ever had a, a moment where I didn't know what to say. I've had plenty of moments where I didn't know the right thing to say sometimes. Right. But, uh, that, but that's, I could probably prevent some of that by uh, soliciting more information from the decision makers about what we're going to do tonight. I don't want to talk to them about what we're going to do tonight. If they want to tell me and there's something they feel compelled that I should know, then obviously help me out, help a brother out. But, uh, bottom line, Connie, is that the least that's why the least I know the better off it is. Cause I like to be surprised. I like to be kind of left to jaw dropping and all that stuff and then relay that verbally to the audience. So, uh, never been a loss for words. I've probably been a loss for the right thing to say. And there's been, there's been opportunities and moments of which I had, which I had back, uh, that I'd like to have been a part of, uh, one is Foley's uh, first title win. And I was on the sideline with Bill's palsy number two or three, hell, I don't know. And, uh, something like that. So, uh, no, I don't think so. I don't think I've ever been a, a total loss for words. I could have done things better. And that's what you try to do every time you go out there. No doubt. Well said. Uh, another question about, uh, your travel these days, Jeremy wants to know what's a normal travel week look like for Jr. these days, last week and next week are probably the exceptions to the general rule. So as a rule of thumb, what's a normal week look like for Jim? Well, normally, uh, I leave on Tuesday, normally Tuesday morning and, uh, fly to the next city. Like this week, I flew from, uh, uh, Jacksonville to Charlotte connecting in Charlotte to Toronto. And then on, uh, Friday morning, uh, I will make my way back to the, to the Toronto airport and fly back to Charlotte, connecting back to Jacksonville on Friday. So that's kind of the story of that deal. It's just, it's almost a wham, bam. Thank you, ma'am. I'm really glad that we're, you know, last week was challenging because we worked on, uh, I helped, uh, at the gorilla position on, uh, and talking to talent on, uh, on Wednesday, then we had a day off and then came back and did rampage live. That's a little tough, but you're out of town more than you thought, and et cetera, but it's not, it's not, a, it's not an undoable thing. It's just this schedule this week is much better because we're not going to stay an extra day. So that's kind of where we are there. And if I say that staying an extra day, it's not like I'm, it's a penance on, uh, uh, on the, the, the city or our brand or anything. Uh, it's just a matter of, uh, flying in today's world, Conrad is, I don't know. You're not on the plane as much as me, unfortunately, it, unfortunately it, it sucks. It sucks. Yeah. That's all there is to it, it sucks. Yeah. And, and I was looking this morning or yes, maybe a Sunday morning. I looked at seat selection, which I really stay on top of. And, uh, these flights are full, they're packed 
you know, you're, I got a good seat, so I'm lucky and fortunate. So, uh, but it's, it's chat flying is horrible right now. I've been in the wrestling business since 74. It didn't start flying a lot until later on. Uh, but I've never seen travel this screwed up oversold mechanicals. They can't manage the traffic flow and all these things. So it's, it's, it's tough. So that's why the extra day sometimes can mean something. You want to get on that, uh, an extra day earlier if you can pull it off, because now you know you're home. Andrew Warren says Jim Ross wore Jordan sneakers on screen a lot during 97, 98. Does he feel one way or another about Jordan shoes? And do you remember there ever being a sneaker deal being discussed for one of the superstars? Unfortunately, no sneaker deal was discussed. I wore those shoes because they matched the outfits that we were wearing at the time, which was black jeans and a raw jacket. Yep. Uh, we, all that red and black just kind of flow together color scheme wise. And that was the reason for it. Uh, plus it was a very popular shoe. They're very comfortable to wear all day around the building, uh, walking on the concrete, you know, hour after hour folks don't realize, you know, uh, I, I, I give you an example in, when we were in DC, uh, we had a, we started at 10 o'clock for rampage. And then after rampage was over at 11 o'clock, we did battle of the belts. So, uh. It's a long ass day, man. Yeah. So you want to stay as comfortable, get as comfortable as you can, because, you know, I, I got the building at two o'clock. I didn't go in the air until eight hours later. And that's, that's hard to maintain your energy level. And you can only drink so much coffee unless you want to, you know, pee a bucket. So, uh, I, I don't want, I don't want to get in that s scenario. Cause once you're out there, you're out there and I got no catheter and I got no porta potty near me. <laughs> Would you sign up for, uh, ringside catheters? Would that be something you would be interested in? No, I've had catheter. You ever have a catheter? I don't want one. I'm going to pass on that. Well, if you had had a catheter, honey, <laughs> you, would have, you had already known the answer to that question. And the worst thing that can happen is to watch the medical person insert it. I don't want to do that. Oh, it ain't, it ain't no fun. I'm a, I'm a sissy. I'm a sissy. Catheters are not for Jr. Maybe that's a t-shirt JR catheters. No, uh, but you know, I, I don't think so. I think I'm, 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 I'll just wait it out. As I say all the time, I'll wear darks there you in go. my adult in my adult men's underwear. I'm well, ready. Let me just tell you the, uh, the pain of a catheter is a process. I'm sure it probably starts with. Ah, oh, oh my God. No, it's a bloodbath <laughs> in here. It's gotta be a better way to get my dagger clean and shiny more safely than this. That's what we all used to deal with when we would cut ourselves shaping shaving before we knew about manscaped. We want to thank manscaped for keeping our dagger slick and ready for whatever the night takes me. Manscaped is now trusted by more than 6 million men worldwide. Join the movement. Go to manscaped.com for 20% off plus free shipping with the promo code Jim Ross. Now, listen, we've all had a little, uh, CSI, Oklahoma shaving incident where when we get done in the bathroom, it looks like a crime scene. Well, it's time yeah. to end those days of shaving <laughs> your balls, looking like a horror movie. The folks at manscaped have the perfect package for your package to get this done. The below the waist grooming leaders have a fourth generation performance package inside. You'll find the legendary lawnmower 4.0 trimmer. That incredible weed whacker, ear and nose hair trimmer, all the liquid formulations and two free gifts. Check this out. The 4.0. That's that lawnmower, the fourth generation trimmer. It's got cutting edge ceramic blades to reduce your grooming accidents. Thanks to their advanced skin safe technology. Also that weed whacker. Woo buddy. You get our age. You start to learn about ear hair. It's a thing. The nose and ear <laughs> hair trimmer is here to whack those goblins that come your way. Both the lawnmower and the weed whacker are waterproof. Use them wherever you use them. And don't forget the liquid formulations. They got the crop preserver ball deodorant. That's for Tony Schiavone. He's acknowledged prior to Manscaped. <laughs> he had stinky balls. Not anymore. And he used some logic with me. He says, hey, I put deodorant on my armpits. Why not my balls? And how about the old crop reviver? Eric Bischoff tells me this keeps his boys out of the water. You'll know what he's talking about when you get a little older. You need a little crop reviver. 
They even threw a couple of gifts in this performance package 4.0. They got boxers and the shed travel bag, and you get 20% off right now with the code Jim Ross at Manscaped. So spend spooky season with the best tools for the job. Go to manscaped.com, get 20% off and free shipping with the code Jim Ross at manscaped.com. That's 20% off with free shipping at manscaped.com. Just use the code Jim Ross, slay your worst pubes and keep your dagger clean with manscaped Jim. Absolutely, man. I, I, uh, I, they sent me a package just the other day and, uh, one of the, all, in addition to all the things you just mentioned, uh, they sent me a, uh, like a shaving kit and, uh, I am, uh, this is my first trip without my old shaving kit, which was an old guy's rule that Jan got me. It's a John Wayne product. I went online to try to find another one, just like the one that she bought me. It's out of sentimental reasons. Couldn't find it. Uh, but I got, when I started digging around all my stuff to get going through my mail. I saw the manscape stuff there. Then all of a sudden, boom, there it was Eureka brand new shaving kit. It's good too, boy. It's solid, got plenty of room. So there's a lot of reasons to, to, uh, uh, support manscape, not only standing the fact that they support us tremendously, the whole ad free network. So, uh, and I'm a proud user of their product. And I, I know you will be too folks. Give it a shot and say 20% for God's sakes. What do you got to lose? Come on. You're going to love it. The promo code is Jim Ross. Get 20% off and free shipping. The mailman cometh. Jim wants to know what are your thoughts on the return of Bray Wyatt to WWE TV? Well, I'm glad he, I think he's a big time player and I'm glad he's back. You know, I, I'm not sure where they're headed with that deal, nor what I want to know. I'd like to watch it unfold when I get a chance. Somebody asked earlier if I watch WWE, I watch them sometimes I do, uh, cause I'm a wrestling fan. Simple as that. That's all. You know, I got my brand, AEW is my brand. That's, that's where I'm, that's what I'm buying my groceries on. And I'm proud to have a job there. Uh, but you know, I, I think he's a, he's a, he's a hell of a talent, no doubt. you know, and, you know, he was an offensive lineman, at, uh, in college. He's got that black Jack Mulligan, uh, Mike Rotunda blood running through his veins. He's athletic as hell for a 300 pound guy. So I, I uh, I'm glad he's back. I'm glad anybody's back for any company. If everybody is on, on board. In other words, I believe that this is going to make uh, Bray Wyatt very happy and very fulfilled. And I think that's a good thing. And, uh, it's also timing wise, I would say, uh, good for, uh, uh, WrestleMania build. Yeah. Cause we're not, you know, we're not that long to Royal Royal rumble. Is he going to win the Royal rumble? Is he going to even be in the Royal rumble? If Bray Wyatt is not going to win the Royal rumble, I wouldn't put him in it. That's just me, but, but again, I'm as a talent, just as a, him being a talent and getting back in the game, I'm happy for him. Well, so well said, I think we all are, uh, Monty has a real question for you, Jim. And this is one of those nice ones where, you know, boy, you made an impression on people and they care about you. Monty says, my question pertains to whether or not JR is happy, not in terms of just wrestling, but in general feels like in the last year or so, he's been struggling to stay upbeat. I'm sure the cancer took a lot out of him. I'm just hoping my old friend, Jim is doing okay. Well, I appreciate that very much. I, I, I get, uh, a lot of messages along those lines. And it's, they're always invigorating. They always make me feel good. Uh, the cancer took more out of me than I was willing to admit, to be honest with you. I, I mean, it's hard to, to, uh, I got a massive open wound on my ankle. Yeah. And it's going away slowly, but you know, I gotta, I gotta prepare to get on the plane. I gotta wrap my leg. You know, I'm not the greatest nurse in the world. I have no patience. I cuss myself out because I can't get the wrap around my leg. Well, well tight or not so tight. It's been really hard. And, and I, I'm kind of glad that I, ignorance is bliss sometimes. Uh, and I, I just didn't realize how hard it's going to be. And it's still hard, it's still hard this very day of, uh, this frigging wound on my, on my ankle. And, and if I wasn't traveling, I probably wouldn't have, I probably would have less issues, but I'm not, I am traveling and I want to travel. I want to go to work. I love working for AEW and I love working for Tony Khan. And, uh, so I just fight, keep fighting, you know, and I, I, I overcome the pain. I, I, I told you this here before. 
you're not off, off, off camera. I haven't been pain free since November. Right. And so sometimes you just kind of get your half ass used to it, but it's not fun, but I appreciate the sentiments very much from everybody. And, uh, skin cancer is no joke. And, uh, 22 radiation treatments inside a month just rip your skin all to hell. And it's just, a, it's like a big crevice down there. So, uh, but that's the hand I got dealt. So I'm going to play the hand and we're going to, at the end of the day, we're going to win. Yes, you are. We're all pulling for you, Jim. And I appreciate you just being honest there and, and cheering. Uh, Murdoch wants to know that episode of WWF live wire where you and Russo were taking calls. Were you legit red ass JR at the callers? This has become viral in the more recent years where you could tell you were a little frustrated at times. Frustrated is the best word. Yeah. It was a system that we had not, we didn't have enough walkthroughs. We needed to have test our equipment and, uh, and all these things. I thought it could have gone better. I thought the idea on the surface was decent. Uh, but it was frustrating at times because we didn't have a good call screener. Uh, if you don't, that's the whole key secret to doing talk radio Yes. to me, you gotta have a good call screener to get you the right calls on so you can play with them Yes. and, uh, and, and, and engage them. So I didn't hate the concept. I just thought our, our execution of it was a little lacking. Uh, Daniel wants to know Barry Wyndham was my favorite wrestler as a kid. Is there anyone who reminds you of him in wrestling today? Well, that's a good question. I wish we had a lot of those guys, <laughs> quite frankly, because he was really, really good. Yes. You don't get too many guys that are six, six and can do spots seamlessly. And, uh, Barry was, he was extraordinary. No doubt about it. I'm trying to think who might be, uh, nothing, nobody pops in my head right now. Maybe before we get off the air here today, something, would, something would jump out at me. I mean, Dustin uh, Rhodes, but he's sort of old school too. I mean, that's not really yeah, a modern I th- name. I think. Th- yeah, you're right. Uh, Dustin would have been, uh, Dustin's a good example. Yeah. It's, but he's also, uh, you know, North of 50 and, but he's a still a hell of a hand. Oh yeah. Every time he has a match, it's, it's always, it's always delivered. Like the match he had with Cody, I thought was one of the best matches ever in AEW. Yeah. Still to this uh, day. I mean, it was the first one and, and, and arguably yeah. the best one. Yeah. It's really good. So, uh, um, uh, but I, 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 I like, uh, I wish we had some more berries. He was really, uh, Barry should have been a long-term NWA champion. It just didn't work out. Another question here from, um, Bob Alvis. What's your best King Kong Bundy story? Oh, some of those, some of those meetings he had with cowboy and Ernie. I've been lazy. Uh, was funny and shit. Ernie called him King Kong tonnage. And, uh, <laughs> he was, had a unique way of motivating his top heel monster heel. There's no doubt in my mind that, that if you're objective. You would agree that King Kong Bundy was an outstanding monster heel. Oh yeah. And, uh, but he is, he, he can get a little lazy on your ass, especially in the schedule that we had in mid South. Cowboy, just because you work last night in Alexandria, doesn't mean you got to, you, you can't work any less tonight in Baton Rouge. And then of course, we're coming on to new Orleans on Thursday. So, oh shit, we've got to really turn it on there. So at, at, at a point in time, your whole body just kind of wears out. Right. And he, he was big and heavy. Probably was overbooked to be honest with you in the sense that he was, he needed more time off to regenerate. Uh, and Ernie didn't believe in that. And, cow, and then of course, cowboy agreed with Ernie. And then Bundy got caught in a crossfire and, and, uh, uh, you know, it, it shortened his stay there, but I always enjoyed working with him. Uh, he was very bitter the last time I saw him, not at me, just at the business in general, uh, at a autograph thing. We we're sitting side by side. I heard the stories for two or three hours and it's all the same shit, man. Talent always talks about cash and creative. So he still talked about the only, the, the best thing I did for Bundy, I think was I gave him the five count mm. and the cow, cowboy liked the five count. So, uh, and I said to Bill, I said, it just goes to show you that this guy is so strong and so formidable that, uh, he can, he can beat you with a five count. He didn't have to use three. He can beat you with five. He'll get that extra two. And it worked out pretty well. So, uh, 
that was a, that was a good gimmick for him. Uncle J 89 wants to know what's your favorite storyline of all time. And what's your favorite match you saw in person as a fan? Well, I think, uh, the Austin McMahon thing was very significant for a lot of reasons. We established the top heel in the territory was unlikely source in Vince and nobody saw that coming. And he was the top heel we had in the attitude era. In my opinion, I said that many times, uh, I used to say that here on the show, the people say, JR is lobbying for a job again. No, I'm not. Vince don't even, Vince not hiring anybody, by the way, you know, I don't notice it. Keep up with the news. Uh, so I, I, uh, that Austin McMahon was my favorite because it drew the most money. Yeah. It made, it's, the other thing fans got to understand is that when Austin was on top and, and selling lots of tickets, when I would do the payoff that just elevated everybody's pay. Yes. Uh, it was, a, it was like that big piece of pie. We're going to make this wonderful pie. And you're going to get a big, nice, healthy slice of it, even though you're not in the main event, because we had the, the asses every 18 inches and it's, we're all going to benefit from it. So, uh, Austin McMahon was probably been my favorite rivalry because it helped launch so many other guys, including triple H, uh, and Mick Foley kind of got, I don't say launched, but he got enhanced yeah. by that, that whole era. So, uh, it, re- it made the undertaker new, new marriages, new things. So uh, Austin McMahon had a lot of tentacles and I thought that was the most significant one I can remember. What was the other part of the question? Was there another part? What's your favorite match you saw as a fan? Oh, as a fan. Well, and I've been so lucky to call so many great matches, but I, 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 I called, uh, I'm trying to think there's been a lot of, there's been a lot of, I think, uh, Eddie and Lesnar was a match I did not call that I was standing at ringside watching, uh, in his cow palace where Eddie went over and became the champion. I thought that was, uh, pretty, pretty amazing. And WrestleMania 20 has some of those moments involving Benoit and, uh, who else, uh, and Eddie. And it was a, it was a very emotional day to say the least. So, uh, but that would be Lesnar and Eddie were would have to be in that conversation on of matches I watched and this one I got to watch in person. So it made it even better. Great question here from, um, Bill P and he says, what do you think about Jim Cornette's idea to make Jr. the head of talent relations at AEW? I haven't had a chance to hear Jim's take on that. I'm sure he said it on his podcast. I know we both think a lot of Jim, even if maybe we don't always share his same opinion. But I guess recently he said, man, you should just let Jr. run talent relations for AW. I don't know that that's something Jr. even wants to do though. What say you, Jim? Not really interested to be honest with you. If Tony Khan came to me and said, I, can you help me with this talent? I, I work with a lot of talents. You we missed the acclaim earlier. I, I don't ever go to a TV. I don't have a conversation with the acclaim word, word low. Another one. I, I, I have a, I have a small list, uh, Darby Allen. Uh, there's a lot of these guys that I, I talk to at every TV. And that's one of the reasons that I go to TVs on Wednesday, even though I'm not broadcasting dynamite, I get the opportunity in a, in a controlled environment, to some, to some degree to help, to talk to these kids, whether it be a catering or backstage or wherever it may be. I don't have an office there. I don't have a, a private locker room there. It's none of that stuff. Uh, so I, I'm a. I'm a big fan of uh, what we're, of what we're doing. And I don't know how, I hope that all these guys that Tony's got around him now are going to continue to do a good job. I'm sure they will. I'm sure they'll try, but, uh, it's not something I'm seeking. If he came to me and asked me to help him, I'd be more than happy to help him. And I still help him. It's just off the record and it's off the radar. So, you know, if you ever talk to some of these talents, you ever talk to JR TV. Oh yeah. So I like that role. It's kind of unofficial Conrad. And there's not a gun to my head about having this meeting and, you know, let's have a quorum and all that stuff. So I'm being facetious. But to be clear, Tony Khan has not approached you about helping with talent relations. Uh, no, uh, now we talk about talent all the time. Yeah. 
but in an official way, approach me in an official way to, uh, get involved. No. And I, and I got no problem with that. I've made it pretty clear to him that that's not a job that I want. It's just, uh, you know, hell Connor, I'm 70. I'll right. be 71 in January for God's sakes. How much barbecue can a redneck eat? Yeah. So, uh, that's kind of where I am on that deal. Again, if the, if the team leader, the team owner were to come to me and say, I need some help here, or I'd like for you to help me, or are you willing to do this or what have you? Obviously I would, I've always been a team player, but, uh, it's not something I'm soliciting or something that I would, I, I don't feel like I've let, let anybody down by not doing it. I'm still helping talent. I'm helping talent. You know, I, I, there's, there's a, like I said, there's a small group of guys that I talk to every TV. And so now that we're on the road like this week, twice, I'll have two, two chances to, to shoot, to breeze the talent and, and, and give them positive reinforcement and little, little critiques. Uh, and you know, I, I talked to MJF. I talked to a lot. I talked to everybody there. They, they, they seek me out because I'm old and experienced and I got a good track record and, and, and talent relations. But I don't need to share that, uh, that that record's established or that precedent's established. So no, I'm not gonna I'm not looking for that role. But again, if 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 called upon, I would serve because I'm a team guy. But I don't expect that to happen, and I'm fine with that. Mac James says the running joke is that Conrad is going to hook you up to a mic so you can record the podcast for the rest of your life. But what does actual <laughs> retirement look like for you? Have you thought about that, Jim? What do you think? Oh retire- yeah. I think about it. I think about it all the time. Uh, I think my contract with AEW is about another year and change. And I'm looking at finishing that out and then taking it from there. So that means I'm thinking about it. Uh, and I haven't talked to Tony Khan about this, but I know my, when I signed it, I signed an extension. I think for 18 months or something like that. And so it's still in effect and I'm, uh, happy with that arrangement. You know, we'll take it, take it, uh, you know, one, one month at a time, one, one week at a time, once this thing. So I don't know if I'm going to stay, uh, or he wants me to stay. I think he does. I know I do, but uh, you know, I gotta also be realistic comrade. You know, I'm not a young kid and uh, maybe I'm doing, maybe I'm traveling too much. Maybe I don't need to come to dynamite. You know, stay at home an extra day, get that where you get on the next airplane. So, uh, I'm not experiencing the plane ride from hell, but next thing to it, screaming babies, pack fights, <laughs> and where do I sit? It's not open seating, ma'am. This is my seat. I'm sitting in 4d. <laughs> so anyhow, it, no, it's, I don't know how to even, how, how to approach that deal. I'm not, I like what I'm doing. Yeah. I really do. I like what I'm doing. And people in wrestling are always looking for that story. Yeah. That dirt. Oh, there's gotta be some dirt there. Cause if I know Jr. he'd want to be in charge of that talent roster. No, I'm not in charge. I don't want to be in charge of the talent <laughs> roster. I want to help the company do well and get established. And when I leave, I will have left AEW a better place than, than I found it. Right. Simple. I like that. Uh, Doug Ferguson wants to know, I'd love to hear your thoughts on Tom Miller. To me, he's a legend and a big part of my childhood wrestling memories. Big voice, big voice, Tom. He was a, Tom was a, I believe Tom, if I'm not mistaken, was an overnight, uh, uh, DJ and really, uh, had a big audience of the truckers, uh, and, and had pipes to in all pipes. So, uh, I, I, my first experience with Tom was when I first went to work for Crockett, cause he was kind of Crockett's go-to he was Crockett's, uh, uh, what's that cat's name? Uh, uh, Michael buffer. Yeah. He was a celebrity. And in that region of the world, he was a big celebrity. So he had great pipes and, uh, quiet fun to be around. Uh, so he was a unique guy and, and very good at what he did. Really fun question here from Anthony. Jim, have you had any contact with Vince McMahon since his retirement? And how do you think he'll adjust to it if he hasn't already? I have not talked to him. Uh, I think I congratulated him on, uh, something, maybe a birth, maybe it's his birthday, but other than, it's all text, no conversations. And we're not boycotting each other. It's just, it's, 
there's nothing there to talk about. So uh, he knows I appreciate him, and he knows that I am I'm very grateful for his help with my career over the years. You know, Connor, God dang, I was there 26 years. Yeah. That's a long time. This McMahon at one time signed me to a 10 year contract. Did you know that? No, I bet you, I bet you didn't even know that. Did you? No. And nor should he need to know it, but, uh, that, that happened. And so he, he made great commitments to me financially and tenure wise and all those things at the end, it got a little shaky, but it got shaky for a lot of people. So you know, I don't, I don't have any remorse. I don't have any regrets. I wouldn't change a damn thing that I've done in my career, but continue to move forward and have fun. And that's kind of where I am right now. People talking about, well, you're going to go with the talent relations. You're going to do this. I really am just kind of in this thing to continue to have fun. I got in wrestling because it was fun to be a fan. And I'm, uh, still using that philosophy. Anthony Chan says, would Jim ever consider returning to WWE to call matches if he was available and the opportunity arose now that it's under quote unquote, new management. That's a, those rhetorical questions are hard to address. Uh, I'm a businessman and I'm a very happy in the business that I'm in with the company that I'm, I'm, I'm doing it with. Yep. What would happen if I didn't have that job and, uh, somebody else wanted me to work for them, work with them or what have you, I, I take it a case by case scenario, but that's not something I'm looking at doing. I, I told Tony Khan this, I, I'd like to finish my, my career full-time career at, uh, at AEW, uh, you know, and maybe it's coming in and doing a pay-per-view. Maybe it's coming in and doing a special like battle of the belts or, or, or the pay-per-views. Like I said, is something that would be interesting to do, but, uh, I don't know. It's hard to, it's hard to position yourself there because the last thing I want to do is get another full-time job. Right. I just, I don't, I don't want to be on the road every week in at that stage of my life, I want to fulfill this contract as great as I can and, uh, and earn my keep and stay where I am until it's time to move on. And we have to be honest about it, realistic Conrad. God damn. Uh, I, I need to, you know, at some point in time, you got to reevaluate. Yeah. You just have to. And at my age, uh, especially it's important. So I don't know about ex- another job, Would I want to do another full-time job with AEW or WWE or anybody else. Probably not. Again, if I was 40 or 50 or 60, uh, I would, I would probably reconsider that, I, that answer, but I'm not, we have to be realistic about shit. You and I talk about our health. That's why we have so many great sponsors on here that, that promote good health. And we've had them for a long time because it, they, our products that we advertise work. Uh, you know, I know we already just talked about, talked about, uh, manscape. Yeah. But, uh, you know, we had to kick out talking about blue chew. Yeah. It, you know, here's the funny thing about blue chew. It works. Yeah, it does. So, uh, and not as long as we keep getting sponsors that work for our audience, I'm all for that. So I don't know how I got on that tangent, but nonetheless, uh, I don't think I want to do another full-time gig other than what I got. Uh, but you never say never just, just look forward. I want my health to be good. I want this cancer to go away. I don't have, I don't, the skin cancer is gone, right? but the remnants of it still exist. And that's what's so frigging painful. So, uh, but you know, every day is another day, man. I got every day. I got, a, I got another day to get better and that's what I'm doing. B Mac wants to know since it's Halloween season, who was the legit scariest individual in wrestling that Jr. ever met? Was there ever anyone he wouldn't want to be left alone with? <laughs> well, because I know everybody so well, uh, you know, I don't know if I'd be fearful of being left alone. Abdullah was very intimidating. Yeah. A- 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 off the screen and on the screen. Uh, so Abby would be in that list for sure. Uh, but he, and he was, what about Brody? How was he in real life? Good. I, I was good friends with Frank. We were, uh, I had some of my best times. I went to major, I went to major league umpire school in 76, uh, in, in St. Pete. 
and he was working for Eddie Graham at that time in the Florida Territory, Frank was. So we'd meet all the time, go have lunch or or breakfast or whatever. We we, came, we stayed friends because he started out as uh, Stan Hansen's tag team partner in, in Mid South, working for the Big Cowboy. So uh, I've always had a great rapport with him. Uh, I never got on his bad side. You have to understand personalities and what you, the limits that you could push them to. And, uh, you, you had no issues understanding the boundaries that Bruce or Brody set for his character and himself as a businessman. Uh, and some people will not agree with it. Some people are listening for us. Oh, geez, JR's kissing Brody's ass. At least he just passed away. You know, I ain't really kissing his ass. I'm just telling you how my experience was with him. He, he was a man. He was an athlete and you treat those guys. In a, in a certain way, and you get everything you want out of them. Every day could be positioned as game day for those guys. So I, 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 enjoy, I never had a, I never had a crossword with Brody. I know that I'm in the minority, but I didn't because I understood him. And I, and, and the key thing is I understood how to communicate with. Him. Right. And uh, not unlike any other football player I ever worked with, uh, or, ath- or a mainstream athlete, he was just uh, was very unique in that respect. Uh, here's one Josh H wants to know what would be the first thing Vince McMahon would change if he was put in charge of AEW. That's an interesting question because it's not necessarily saying Jim, what do you think needs to change about AEW? But what yeah. do you think the old man wouldn't like about AEW? He probably would like less wrestling. And more <laughs> yeah, that's probably accurate. And, uh, you know, I would probably venture to say. Conrad, that Vince has never watched the first minute of AEW. I would venture to say he probably hasn't watched the first minute of any wrestling show since he's been gone. Oh, I'm now, sure. Be- I'm sure he hasn't watched much wrestling since he's been gone. But it's hard for me to imagine when the show first started, he didn't watch a little bit of it. He might have just peaked. Yeah. Uh, uh, what does it look like? What's it sound like? Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. Yeah. You know. Uh, he probably didn't think it would last three years. Yeah. And now we're, we moved on from that. We're past that now. Uh, it would be hard for him to, I think my opinion is it would be hard for Vince to come into AEW, uh, cause he would be totally unfamiliar with, you think he knows all about Darby Allen. You think he knows all about orange Cassidy, right? What's an orange Cassidy, Jr. Well, you know, somewhere along the way, you got to watch these shows. You gotta, you gotta take the time to invest in the characters. So I don't know that he would be able to give you a, a real good, uh, feel or good feedback, or how would you tweak it, uh, without watching the product as sincerely and as thoroughly as he should. That's my take on it. I think that ship has sailed. I think you know, there's no way in hell he would, he's got money. He's seventies, mid seventies. Let him have some fun for God's sakes. Yeah. He's earned it. Yeah. Brandon wants to know what would Jr. think about professional wrestling, having a union to support their needs for medical and retirement programs. Well, I think in theory, it's not a bad idea. You know, I know that AEW takes care of injuries and, and uh, medical bills and things like that. And I'm sure WWE does as well. Uh, but there's a lot of them that don't. So in the, at the end game, it'd be a great idea to do it. But you know, uh, I've had guys, oh, oh, vets say that the, there'll never be a wrestling union because the boys can't trust each other. They don't want anybody else touching their money, but them. And when you got to give up a little bit to, to get a little bit in this, uh, a union type scenario. So I, I'm, I, I, I know it's a good idea, but I don't think it'll ever happen because of the trust factor. Here's one from, uh, Michael. Does Jr. think Excalibur is being overworked when it comes to reading match lineups? We've seen the old pats and chuckles when he reads them. Just want to, uh, know what your <laughs> thoughts are. And of course I've always got a chuckle out of that because it does feel as if sometimes it's tough to figure out who's supposed to do what in the three man booth, especially as somebody just watching on TV, but it does feel like whenever those come up, you know, that's Excalibur spot. He's going to yeah. micro machine that shit as fast as he can to let you know. He's told to, he's told to, yes, hurry and get through it. Yes. And I think, and I've told him this and it's not his fault. This is how he's produced. 
uh, he goes at breakneck pace. And sometimes I wonder how much of that information that he's distributing is actually retained because it is a throw. It's almost, I almost say it's a throwaway. It's just so fast. So much information coming at the fans and some of you really, really need for them to, uh, digest process. And sometimes I think we could do a better job of maybe slowing down just a hair and, uh, letting the audience process what you're, what you're, what they're hearing. He does a great job. He's, he's one of the hardest working guys. The other day I saw him, he was getting ready to go out and do dark or something. He loves doing it, but, uh, hard working son of a bitch. I'll tell you that right now. And he does a good job. I'm glad he's out there. It makes my job a lot easier. Well, I'll tell you what else makes our job a lot easier, Jim, and that's reserve bar. It's our online source for premium and luxury spirits, wine and champagne. And now reserve bar offers same day delivery. Reserve bar has a vast lineup of rare and hard to find bottles, your premium brands, your celebrity spirits, and all the limited releases that you just can't find at your local store. No one does spirits gifting better than reserve bar looking for an elevated gift. Reservebar.com has you covered and you can have that gift right delivered to your door. So even better, turn that spirits gift into a cherished memento with custom engraving. That's right. You can get the bottle engraved. It's perfect for birthdays, <laughs> weddings, anniversaries, father's Great. day, you name it. Maybe you're getting into home bartending. Well, reserve can set you up. Reserve bar has everything you need. They've got spirits for the shelves. Sure. But they've also got every barware tool and glass you could ever need. Reserve bar even has a great feature called cocktail lounge. It's like a treasure trove of cocktail recipes, bartending tips. They've got interviews with master distillers, celebrities, and more. The hot trend in spirits right now though, is the ready to drink cocktail. Have you tried these? They taste better than ever. And reserve bar has a huge collection of them. These canned cocktails are great for parties when you don't have time to tend the bar. They're ideal for tailgating, which we know is in full swing right now. Right. Reservebar.com has all the barware, glassware, cocktail recipes, everything you can need. And maybe you need something for a party tonight. A reserve bar offers same day delivery straight to your door. Maybe you forgot a birthday gift. Remember reserve bar to the rescue for same day delivery. Now a peek behind the curtain last year, Jim was looking for something he couldn't find. I found it on reserve bar, had it delivered to Jim's house in Jacksonville. I'm in Huntsville. They delivered it to his house. Visit reservebar.com today. Use the promo code JR to save $10 off your purchase of $75 or more on spirits, wine, or pre-made cocktails, but only when you use our special offer at reservebar.com with the code JR that's reservebar.com. The promo code is JR. And this offer expires December 31st, 2022. Remember that's reservebar.com and the code is JR. So how about that, man? Reserve that's bar. a good deal. No, it's a good deal. You, I, I, uh, ordered the other day and, uh, got it right away. The, uh, a good company. And what a, I, I've always been amazed at the creative entrepreneurship that we, ex we experience here on our show from our sponsors. It's just an idea that's past its time. So if I got, if I need something, if I got a lady coming over and she's a tequila drinker and I don't have any tequila in my, I got, a, I got, it's easy. I order it. Boom. And in a, in a few minutes I got it. So, uh, I can act like I actually know how to date. Which I don't. <laughs> so it's a good, it's a good company folks. And it's, and as Conrad said, I think one of the most underrated things is the fact that it's, it makes a great gift. Yes. And that, that, uh, signing the, you know, the engraving on the bottle. How cool is that? Yeah. Yeah. It's cool as hell. So give it a shot folks. Y'all have a lot of little drink every now and then we're getting close to the holiday season where we're drinking a little bit more. So, uh, give them a shot. I, I, I got full confidence in them. They've done, they treated me really well, really well. Check it out. Reservebar.com. The promo code is JR save 10 bucks on your purchase of 75 bucks or more at reservebar.com. Uh, girl is crafty wants to know, Jr. you master smoker. You what's the proper way to smoke a Turkey low and slow. There you go. Uh, it's pretty simple. It, it may be two twenty five, somewhere in that neighborhood degrees. Yeah. And, um, uh, and for, you know, I'm a long-term guy, 10 hours. Yeah. And that's why you don't, 
That's why people covet they smoke meat so much is that it takes so damn long to prepare them correctly. Yeah, it does. So it's low and slow is, uh, and there's a zillion pieces of information on online about smoking and, uh, how that, how, how best works. But I think that everything, the one encompassing statement is low and slow wins the race. Totally. Well said, Jacob wants to know, what does JR think the wrestling business will look like in 20 years? I wish I knew, man. First of all, I probably would not be around, so it won't matter to me. Uh, I'll be haunting people for heaven. Hopefully heaven. I'll make the right turn. Uh, hard to say, man. Uh, I think it'll still funnel back to what the TV producers and the talents themselves are providing in ring. I think the interviews are going to go right along with, uh, uh, our, our trends, sound bites, get in, get out, tell your message. I think some promos in all companies are too long, uh, and they lose me at times. Uh, but bottom line is it's, not, it's just a, it's just a matter of, uh, you know, shit having like making sure this damn thing makes sense. Give me a beginning, a middle and the end of these promos and write your finish first. You're, you're in line first and work backwards and do it all in a couple of minutes. I just think that, uh, in general, things are, are a little bit long. I think in the future, uh, we'll adapt to public trends, uh, giving soundbite interviews that shorter, more, uh, I don't want to say orchestrated. But where you really got a, a definitive start, middle, and end, I think that's a big thing. I think that's where we're still going to head. But I, just, I do believe that at the end of the day, what we see bell to bell is still going to be your meal ticket. That's going to be your entree. David wants to know, do you know if it, there were ever any talks between AEW and Bray Wyatt? And do you think a similar character could have worked in AEW? It's hard to replicate Bray Wyatt. I don't know if Bray Wyatt ever interviewed with Tony Khan or not. It wouldn't surprise me if he did. I don't know. Uh, you know, Bray may have had this plan all along. I'm going to take some time off. I'm going to go back to, uh, the roost back to the nest better said. And, uh, but I don't know if they've ever, they've ever talked. They may have, hell, I don't know. Uh, I don't, like I said, I'm not a talent relations guy. I don't get involved in that. I think that's the, the, the horse is out of the barn. He wanted to go back to WWE and I don't think any amount of money that Tony could have offered him was going to supplant uh, his career in WWE. It's me. I might be wrong too. Conrad. Hell, I don't know, but, uh, I think it'd be silly if you're in the wrestling business and this talent was a free agent that if you didn't at least engage him in a conversation or just to determine his level of interest, if there was any interest, my take on it is that there was never any major interest. It was all about, uh, the right place, right time to get him back in the game. Interesting question here from chance Richardson. Who's the craziest talent Jr. negotiated with as head of talent relations. Any good stories? Every, every negotiation had its own story. Uh, the talent want to hear what their, what their downside guarantee is going to be. Uh, what's the worst, in other words, the worst case scenario that will uh, happen on, on this contract, X dollars, wherever, wherever it may be. And then of course they're interested in creative. It's almost like you got to get in the game to get interested in creative. You got to get a contract signed. I can't help. I, I never promised anybody a spot in my role that, uh, cause I didn't feel like it was the timing was off. Get your contract signed. Let's get you on the team. Let's get you a Jersey. Let's get you fixed up. And now let's begin the process of using your feedback and others feedback for your character, invest in the, your own creative. It's very important, but you can't do that unless you got a contract signed. Jim, we just got the craziest question I've ever seen on an ask Jim, anything. Should I ignore it or ask it? I'll ask it. Diane wants to know, would Jim rather have penises for fingers or vaginas for ears? Oh, no, that's good. I, I don't know if I can even answer that. <laughs> I don't know what. <laughs> That's a good I, one, huh? 
I just, who thinks of this? It's amazing. Uh, Somebody's got a lot of free time. Uh, on this day oh. in WWE has an excellent question. Any similarities Good. between AEW buying ring of honor and JCP buying the UWF, the opportunities, the struggles to amalgamate them into one company. Um, I haven't really thought of that debate or that discussion. No. I mean, I, I don't really even see a ton of the similarities outside of perhaps allegedly WWE was going to try to buy that library. So maybe there was a little competition for that, but I don't, I don't really, you, you live through both of them. What say yeah. you different? They're different deals. You know, UWF had television established television network over a hundred stations. Uh, we had a pretty good talent roster that they absorbed, brought out like, you know, Rick Steiner and sting and all these cats, uh, Dr. Death. We had a, we had a good roster. Not that the ring of honor didn't or doesn't when they were running, but we had television and that was a key thing right there. And ring of honors, that's where they will fail. Uh, as far as co th this comparison that, that we're talking about is concerned. Um, so I think they're two different, two entirely different deals. I have no idea what Tony's going to do with, uh, uh, ring of honor. I know he's committed to it. He's, he bought them and it's nice to have those guys around. Sometimes it gives us some diversity. And some, some, something broadens the scope a little bit, but I think, uh, I think they're just two entirely two different deals, quite frankly, Conrad. I think what you said is spot on. You never thought of it that way. Yeah. And, the, and I, I haven't either. So we're, we're on the same page there. Let's do, uh, another question here. This one comes to us from Lucas. I've heard stories about how over the junkyard dog was in mid South. Is there anyone in the current wrestling world with his level of charisma back then? Oh yeah, sure. There's a lot of, them, but not, he was unique because he was a, a jacked up 300 pound African American with a, with amazing gift of gab. Uh, and those kind of guys are hard to replicate. You got to remember that dog was writing his own promos. We had no script writers in mid South or UWF. So he was creating his own content, which could be blessing or curse. So, uh, but he's, he's, he would always be hard to replicate. His ethnicity, uh, was unique. Uh, you know, I've, like I said on the show, I've, I've, I've been a party to many, co uh, so, uh, conversations, speakerphone conversations that that cowboy had with other promoters that were incredulous that bill was giving a, a black man the big push. Uh, and he also, to make it matters worse, had a black booker. So the, the good old boy Caucasian ex wrestler thing reared its ugly head on more than one occasion. So Cowboys only like green. That's his favorite color. He didn't give a shit what color. I, I think that's kind of funny because he's allegedly a racist and all these things. I don't believe that to be true for one minute. You would not put your territory in charge of an African-American, if you weren't comfortable working with, the, with African-Americans, you just wouldn't, that's your livelihood, it's everything. So, uh, you know, I think, uh, I think watch made some good decisions in that regard, as far as equality and opportunity and things of that nature. McCrory wants to know, do you think Gina Hernandez could have made it as a top star in either WCW or the WWF? Uh, as a heel, do you think there would have been a place for him based on what you saw? Yeah. Uh, Gino was very talented, had great natural instincts. He's a better heel than a baby face. Good looking kid. Uh, but it, it, unless he can manage his cocaine habit, there's no chance. So if you're saying, well, if he was drug free and he had been on a, and had cleaned out all that stuff, would he have had a, a, a value? Absolutely. Absolutely. He's a big time talent, but his love of cocaine was more important to him than showing up to work and having great matches. At least that's my take on John Gradwell says, I just watched Papa Shango versus El Matador, the dark match from WrestleMania nine on the network. And I wanted to know how Jr. felt about having Bruce produce him in his ear. The commentary seemed that Jr. was a bit frustrated. I may be wrong there. Is there anything you can tell us about that match? I believe this was your first match you ever called in the WWE. 
Well, it wasn't the first one. We had done TV before we left to go to Vegas uh, for a challenge and, and superstars. So it wasn't the first. It was the first live to tape, I guess, or however you're going to put it. Uh, I think Bruce and Vince had a little fun with me that night, just screwing around. And Vince, I could, I could almost shut my eyes and envision Vince standing over Bruce sitting in the uh, director's chair or whatever and giving me things to tell me just to have fun. And I wasn't in any mood to have fun. I was, I was in the mood to call great matches and, and be a part of WrestleMania nine, nine, uh, not 99, but nine. Uh, so I think they just had a little fun that night and it got frustrating until it got, we got settled into the card and, you know, and then everything went along fine, but I think they had a little bit more fun than I deserved. <laughs> Uh, Jeff wants to know what's your go-to cut of steak. I always go for the poor man's ribeye, AKA the Del Monaco Chuck eye. Well, my go-to is a strip, Jim. What's yours? I like, uh, I like the, I'm a ribeye guy as well. Uh, I like my steaks charred medium. That's the, they call it the Pittsburgh and, uh, charred medium is my, my favorite, uh, way to prepare it. Uh, that's why I like Gibson so much in Chicago and other great steakhouses. When you go walk in and your service says, how do you want your steak? And I say, charred medium or Pittsburgh, you know, that they got it. They yep. understand. Yep. So, uh, I like a bone in filet a lot. So, uh, but it's red meat, Conrad. Hell, I don't, I don't, I'm not prejudiced at all. I'm, I'm not, you know, I like a ball, but I think if I had my pick, I would have a bone in filet about nine ounces and I would have it prepared, uh, charred medium. Look at there. Instagram, a wrestling historian says, who do you think should have been the black scorpion instead of Ric Flair? Well, that's a hard question because we, you know, Oli was only booked that angle of the black scorpion out of spite, you know, just that he was just being Oli. So it was, uh, there wasn't a lot of preparation and it sure as hell wasn't any meetings. So what do you guys think about the black scorpion? Everything was holy, the voice, the promos, the whole deal. And he was doing it again, uh, in a kind of out of spite, as I've mentioned. So there wasn't a lot of planning going on. Going. I know so, somewhere on the way Al Perez was talked about, uh, but he, it needed to be somebody, uh, at another level. Yeah. Not that there's anything wrong with Al's work, but he wasn't perceived as a star at that time. So I'm asking the black scorpion as Al Perez might not have been the impact that you're seeking, but it, it's hard to say. I would say it needed to be somebody that, you know, a, a character that could play mind games like a Jake Roberts type guy or somebody like that. But I would, I would probably start it with somebody that wasn't even in the territory. I'd try to find somebody that had star power and that would come in for the right number, right dollar. Uh, but I don't, I, I think it should have been an outsider, somebody fresh and new. And, uh, I'm sure Rick might agree with that too. Now. I don't know. Matt wants to know, has Jim ever gifted one of his trademark black hats? Well, God bless my little wife, Jan. She did, you know, these hats are a thousand bucks a pop. They're made at shorty's cowboy hattery in the stockyards district of Oklahoma city. So I can call them right now and say, it's JR. I need a hat. They know I want my eyelets, three eyelets on each side. They want to, I want a four inch brim. I want a, the best hat you got, which is a hundred X hundred percent beaver. 30 years. I just pulled up their website and boy, they, uh, they got quite the operation over there. Do they not shorties shorties hattery is kind of uh, a big oh, deal, yeah. dude. Anybody wants to buy a hat, I mean, a handmade. And, uh, they're right, right at, right at a grand. I think my last was 900 and some shorties hattery.com is where you can go. S H O R T Y S hattery shorties, shorties, a man, uh, a female. She's a character, man. She's exactly what you would think. She wears her hat all the time. Uh, she's a, just a, one of the, one of the boys. So shorties is a, a great place to go. And, and, uh, I. I've done business with them for years, but my, the point was, have I, uh, yes, I have gifted through Jan would gift until she found out she didn't even know what the hats cost. So, you know, you just gave away a thousand dollar hat. I did. Yeah. 
<laughs> yeah, it's okay. We'll buy another one. So I, now I've got like four hanging in Oklahoma, one hanging right in this condo here in Jacksonville. So it's a fun, it's a, it's a good thing. I, I, I like to donate. I can't donate hats every week. I just looked their place up, man. That's a cool setup. I got to check that out next time I come to visit. That's a cool spot. Yeah, I'll take you there. Cause the, one of the best restaurants in America is two blocks down the street called the Cattleman Steakhouse. Okay. Big time, big time. So, uh, and uh, you would love it. I promise you yeast rolls or like granny used to make, or mama used to make, depending how old your folks are, uh, just amazing. So I, I'm a big, I'm a big fan of that whole stockyards district. The not on this, not on the cattle and steakhouse, which is one of my go-tos in Oklahoma or anywhere else. Uh, and, uh, so if you're through Oklahoma city, head to the famous historic stockyards district, and you'll see Shorty's hattery and about two or three blocks down the street, you'll see cattle and a steakhouse two for one, a two for, but I feel strongly that saving money is important. You know, if it's not something we worry about now, boy, we are really going to worry about it later. And I want to help you get out of debt faster and do it with cheaper monthly payments. I'm talking to you. If you're in a 30 year loan, now is the time to take years off of your loan. We're routinely helping our listeners cut five, 10, even 15 years off their loan. And you can do this without perfect credit with no money out of pocket. You've just got to start at savewithconrad.com. It's about what Lucha is. Lucha is huge in Mexico. Lucha, you have villains, you have uh, heroes, and the champion, even, even our most important championship is called the Mega Championship. When you become the Mega Champion, you become the man. You are the champion that everybody gets because in, in Mexican cultura or Lucha cultura, the Mega Championship is not defended on every pay-per-view, on every card. No, it has to be a special moment. It has to be a special challenger. We have Phoenix and Hijo del Vikingo. Phoenix, you already know us, Lucha Brothers, some of the better and fantastic matches that AEW has had has been with the Lucha Brothers. So you're coming to a big main event in Triple Mania's uh, 30th anniversary. You have an ex-Mega Champion, because Phoenix had already conquered that championship and he has said to Hijo del Vikingo, you're good, but you're not Phoenix. The promo that Hijo del Vikingo did today, to me, was something that has never been done. He sat down in the turnbuckle, and then he just opened up his heart and said, I dreamed of becoming the mega champion. And on that day, October 15, I'm not gonna admire you as I do now. I'm not gonna respect you as I do now, Phoenix. It's you and me, mano a mano, and the goal stays with you. If you have not seen Hijo del Vikingo, let me tell you, this guy is unbelievable. Unbelievable. And when you put Phoenix and him together, it's Triple Mania. They are gonna give you the best match that you have ever seen in your life. And that is for the Mega Championship, or in Spanish, Mega Campeonato, Hijo del Vikingo versus Phoenix. Wu Wings, a virtual restaurant concept from the man himself, the nature boy, Ric Flair. Enjoy the legendary flavors and world championship wings by ordering with your Uber Eats or Postmates app. Wu Wings is now open in Nashville, San Antonio, Jacksonville, Florida, as well as Huntsville and Tuscaloosa in Alabama, with many more locations coming soon. Try the only chicken wings worthy of carrying the name of the 16-time world heavyweight champion. Tell them, Nate. Wu Wings, legendary flavors, world championship wings. Woo! Wu Wings. Yeah! Woo woo! Gavin wants to know the internet loves negativity, but who are some of the most historically positive locker room or office personalities you've met through your career? Positive. Well, there's influences. a lot. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Oh, just saying positive influences. Who do you think? Yeah, there's, I think that 
in one era, there was more positivity than negativity uh, because of, of the that we call social media now the the it seems like the negative feedback carries more weight gets more exposure gets more tweets all that shit uh but it's it's kind of demoralizing you know i i stay off uh, the i i go on and manage our twitter i do the twitter so i i'm happy to do that and i'm have fun doing it until you get into the deep water somebody's wanting to you should have seen the feedback I got when Oklahoma got beat by Texas. You know, uh, Oklahoma, you shitting me? Oklahoma, we beat you son of a bitch just four games in a row. When's the last time you won the Big Twelve? I could probably answer that for you. Years. So uh, that's just that's the nature of the beast. Right. Somebody went out of their way to figure out to say Oklahoma, and and send it to me. They may have gotten blocked. To be honest with you. Because what, what's the use in it? Well, that's free speech, and I got the right. Yeah, you got the right to write whatever the hell you want. I got the right to block your ass. So there you are. Well, let's jump into it. We got another question here. This one's from uh, Mike, and this is a great one. When did you find out you were calling Taker and Roman at Mania? Was there a thought at the time this might have actually been Taker's last match? It certainly felt that way with you coming back to call it. Well, uh, I believe it was the, uh, either one that day or the day before, you know, uh, I, I, I believe the best I can remember, I was very honored to get to do it, to be part of that match, even though I was the third wheel and that didn't feel great. Uh, but it was what it was, but I, I would say within 24 hours of the event, Conrad safely say. Let's, uh, let's do another one here. This one's from CJ Whitmore. If you could get front row seats to any wrestling show in history and just watch as a fan, what show would it be and why? Wow. Well, there's been a lot of good ones. Uh, probably, uh, maybe something from the, uh, Crockett era, uh, with, uh, Starcade shows, big, the big, the big stuff. Might've been a, a consideration for sure. Um, the, uh, cowboy had a real cool, uh, payoff to the junkyard dog blind angle that I wish I was been there to see that. That was at the Superdome. Golly, I'm trying to think, uh, so many of these great matches, I got to be there. So I was, I was lucky in that respect. So I, I don't know. That's hard to pinpoint one down, but one of those Crockett shows with something because it was great wrestling from start to finish. Uh, Cowboys, some of the Cowboys uh, spectaculars or extravaganzas as he called them. Uh, certainly would be interested in that. Um, trying to think. I'm trying to think of something else. That might, you know, WWE had so many good shows. They had a lot of pay-per-views, obviously, before I got there because I got to, there at WrestleMania 9. So there's just been a lot of them, Conrad. If you're a fan like you and I, it's hard to make that. It's like saying, who's your favorite pet? Who's your favorite child? I don't know. I don't know. Uh, I like, I like dogs. Let's go to the one that's got the most dogs on it. I don't know. Yeah. So it's a hard one to answer. Hard one to answer. Let me give it some thought. Uh, Lauren Eason wants to know what was it like to reunite with your old WWE coworker, Kevin Kelly at AEW's forbidden door. Always fun working with Kevin. He does a good job. You know, I'd like to think I was there for him in the early days for whatever reason. I, and I don't know if it was an issue he had with Kevin Dunn. I don't know. He didn't, he wasn't received well there. Kevin I'm referring to he thrown in boy. Uh, so. Uh, but it was fun. Kevin's become a really good announcer, really good. And he gets a lot of reps, of the high quality product. So he does a good job. He works hard, pairs hard. So I always enjoy anytime I see him, uh, catching up and, and, and chatting. So, but he's a, he's a very talented kid. He's not a kid anymore. He's losing his hair. Something you and I can't say. No. Uh, <laughs> Tony Flowers says, during your time in the business, what talent do you believe to love being a professional wrestler the most? 
Like, was there one person who was so passionate and happy about their job that they stand out to you? Oh man. All the great ones kind of stand out because they had to be, they had to have tenure and they had to have, uh, you know, had to improve their game continually, uh, to, to pull off what you're saying. Uh, you know, there, there's so many guys, uh, that just loved being in the business. I, I tell you, this is an oddball answer. Uh, Rico Constantino. Okay. Probably, probably loved being a wrestler more than anybody I can recall off the top of my head. Uh, so, but it really, the love of the product is essential. If you're going to be a star, you can get by for a while on, on hype and, and, uh, emotion, but long-term you've got to really love what you're doing. And, uh, I know Rico and his crazy role and he was a little goofy like the rest of us. Uh, uh, he, I don't think there's anything in the world he would want, he would want to do more than being a wrestling business. I'll tell you somebody we have now in AEW is uh, William Regal. He's there early every single time. He's in the ring in the morning working out with talent. Uh, he's a great coach, mentor, teacher. Uh, one of my favorite guys to be around. He dresses in the announcer's locker room now, which is great. Let's so get all pick his brain. So, but he, uh, he's totally committed to the product, to the genre. And I, I, that I like, uh, so, but there's always a few, you know, that, that's the great thing about these questions. Now, later today, I'll probably remember some answers of questions you asked now. I said, oh, I wish I said this. I wish yeah. I said that guy. Yeah. It's just hard to retrace that. So, especially once this stuff is covering a uh, near 50 year career. Radio McCall says you've talked a lot about big men like Vader, but we haven't heard much about Bam Bam Bigelow. What were your thoughts on him? And also, do you have any stories or interactions with Lord Alfred Hayes? Well, I tell you, uh, two entirely different guys. Alfred was an old territory guy, tougher than hell. Uh, certainly looked at as a comedic figure. He had a great laugh. He was a great sidekick of some of those studio shows that, uh, WWF produced back in those days. Uh, tough guy, Judo Al Hayes is his first ring name, as I, as I recall. <clears throat> he did great promos, great heel promos. The arrogant, overbearing, uh, aloof manager. So, but Alfred was a very talented guy and a very tough guy. Uh, Bam Bam obviously was so gifted, uh, it wasn't even funny. You don't get guys that are his size that could do his things. And sometimes they're the, the, Negative, negative feedback on Bam Bam was the fact that he may have done too much at times. You know, you don't have to have a guy doing moonsaults, right? That she's going to beat somebody with it. And, uh, sometimes that didn't happen, but he was a really gifted guy. Athletically, I had a decent high school amateur background that our fans in the, the Northeast would probably have a better judge of than I, but, uh, he always seemed to be, I don't know if it was just the way he was raised or the company he came up through. I don't know. He always seemed to be very untrusting, but he was a very talented guy. And again, drugs and alcohol got him. No matter how big, how strong, how whatever, he, you're not immune to that shit. So it's too bad. It happened the way it did, but very talented dude, man. He, he, he evade her. And there's others with man gang, uh, big boss man when he's three fifty. a lot of those guys are just really a, amazing, super heavyweights and, uh, bam, bam deserves to be in that conversation. A couple more and then we'll wrap this one up. We got a question here from RA hindsight being 2020. What could Jimmy Crockett have done to salvage the UWF purchase? It still seems like a lost opportunity. I think it was a lost opportunity personally. Uh, I think that, uh, he could have given the UWF brand some credibility by having their talents, uh, be on TV, specifically TBS. Why the UWF guys were not on TBS was strictly a, a political issue. You got all these incumbents, all these great stars that, uh, believe that they had pioneered and were the strongest cont uh, contributors to the TBS brand. And, uh, maybe they weren't, maybe it was time to get a little newer, 
Maybe it's time to change up things a little bit, but that did not happen. And so then they just cherry picked the three or four guys. They thought had some something going. Like I said earlier, staying, it's one of them Steiner. I can't remember. We have both Steiners. Here. I think we have both of them. So they're both good. So when you get a, one of the top single guys in a business and staying young, new, fresh, and then you got a great team like the Steiners, it seems to me like you could have done more with them. And I still believe that a super bowl type environment would have been a, a very apropos. So you'd have a, you'd have no, no common pay-per-views, but you'd have, uh, except once a year and once a year, you'd have the, the super bowl type thing, but, uh, the pressure on Jimmy to not give up seats on the private plane pressure on Jimmy to make sure that somebody got more TV, didn't get as much TV time as maybe somebody else. And he was trying to be Mr. Everything. And he, and he was very talent friendly for the most part till the very, very end until the talent started letting him down. So, uh, I, I think that it could have been done a whole lot differently. You got to get some guys over and you don't get them over by coming in and, and losing, uh, to every Tom, Dick and Harry that you can book them with. And I, I, and I'm, that's an extreme statement. But point being is, is that some of those guys never got a chance to really get over. And I think that's, that was a big, big mistake. So it devalued their star power. So you, now you're devaluing your purchase. They Crockett just wasn't prepared for that, that sale. Yeah. And financially or infrastructure wise or what have you. And it goes back to the same old shit, man. It's just hard to have your booker as your top baby face. Right. In that era, not before, but I guarantee it's just not that way today. So anyhow, uh, that's what I would have done. I, I would have made the, I'd have, I'd have had some trades. I'd have had, I'd have run it like a sports type thing in some facets but that's not what occurred. And all of a sudden the value of the whole roster, the value of the brand was completely devoid. And I think that was a huge mistake. Well, if there were a mistake to go to jrsbbq.com, uh, everybody knows that the best barbecue sauce around is at jrsbbq.com. You've heard me brag about it forever. The all purpose seasoning, the, uh, main event mustard, the chipotle ketchup, two different types of sauce too. And it's all happening at jrsbbq.com. And I think. You are running promotions like every week, like every Wednesday. I know a couple of weeks ago you said, Hey, we'll give you a, a free sauce for every $15 spent. Yeah. So lots of really cool promotions. Check it out every Wednesday, jrsbbq.com. Uh, go this morning, see what the new special is because you guys are running specials left and right. Business is a booming over there at JRS. We're trying, we're sure trying Connor to give the fans a value for their investment. Uh, you know, our products are not gimmicks. You know, uh, I don't need a gimmick attorney to figure that out. No, I'm not knocking the gimmick attorney. He's sensitive though. I don't want to to clarify. He is very sensitive. Yeah. I gotta be careful. So, uh, but we, we have specials all the time and the goal is just to get you to try it. Right. So if I discount products down to a level that it, they're very affordable, then get you some and try it out. Uh, if $15 is going to break a yay or nay, maybe Conrad and I should help you out with a GoFundMe or something. I don't know. Kidding. Kidding. Well, Conrad. We probably get them some cheaper monthly payments over at save with Conrad.com. <laughs> then they can live a little at jrsbbq.com. Enjoy their best life. With some of that seasoning, daddy. That's it, baby. Seasoning is, is idiot proof, quite frankly. Yep. And, uh, I'm glad you love it. I love it. It's uh every time I use it, it reminds me of my little bride. She was the instigator of all that. And, uh, she, she signed off on it, but she was not a barbecue person being from Pittsburgh. Right. I'm not saying there's not barbecue place in Pittsburgh. So don't go crazy on folks. Are you Steeler fans? You got enough to worry about with your football team. Uh, other than, you know, what we're talking about here, as far as the seasoning is concerned, I just, she would be un very unhappy happy right now with me talking about the Steelers and the season the Steelers are having. It's just hard to believe that, that black and gold's losing because they're so established. 
And uh, but anyway, that's another topic for another day. Uh, but yeah, I'm, our business has been good, and we're getting orders out quick. Anybody's got an issue, you can you know message me or whatever. You shouldn't have any issues. That's our goal. So uh, we appreciate everybody's support. We really truly do. I'm very grateful. Very grateful. And again, it costs nothing to look, honey. Not a damn dime. Go check it out. JRSBBQ.com. Next week, we'll be back talking No Mercy 2002. We got Brock Lesnar and The Undertaker in a Hell in a Cell. We got Triple H and Kane unifying the world title and the IC title. And oh, yeah, a little thing called Katie Vick. That's what we'll be talking about next week here on the show. You get all of our shows early and ad free over at adfreeshows.com. And boy, we are doing a double scoop of the bonus content this week. We've got my recent conversation with Bill after for a little program we call insiders. He's going to tell you some Vince McMahon and Hulk Hogan stories you've never heard before. We also recently sat down with the steam belt maker, Dave Milliken on the one year anniversary of Reggie parks passing to talk about the WCW world title that was made famous by Ron Simmons. When he became the first black heavyweight champion 30 years ago, pretty iconic title. We talk about that in long form. We even had Raven sit down with Eric Bischoff to talk about what the hell happened to WCW all those years ago. It's been a long time coming. We did a Raven episode with Eric and we just said, Hey man, what if we try to get these guys together? And we did. We've also got Tony Schiavone doing a live Q and a Jake Roberts, watching the old Halloween havoc 92 show. Something for everybody at adfreeshows.com. Go check it out. I think you're going to dig it. And next week, man, before you know it, No Mercy 2002 will be here over the weekend. We hope that you pull for Alabama to stomp out Double J's Tennessee Volunteers. (laughs) Then, of course, this Saturday night, I hope you'll check out. I can't believe I'm actually going to be there. It's going to be so fun. My very first Triple Mania. I've been to a Wrestle Kingdom. I've been to a Wrestle Mania and now a Triple Mania. You can watch on fight as well at watch triple Jim, this was a fun show, man. I love little ask Jr. anything. Yeah, it's fun. I do too. I like to hear what the fans are thinking and what, uh, what's of their interest right now. Uh, I hope you got good seats for your big event this Saturday. I'm sure you do. I got a friend and I think, he, I think I'm getting good seats. So we'll uh, see. I, I bet you are. You taking a bodyguard with you? Uh, I don't know that I, I don't know that I need one the way I'll be traveling. We'll see. Okay. We'll see. Well, enjoy it. Enjoy the whole going to a live event and not having to produce it. Man, that's fun. That's fun. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Uh, And by the way, uh, fans really did a good job of throwing uh, some ideas and suggestions about some of my calls over the year. Yeah. We're going to, it's going to be a part of my, the book. So if you got ideas on favorite calls. Just, uh, tweet them to me at JRSBBQ. And, uh, I, I appreciate all that because it's, I want to know what the fans are thinking. What, what moves you, what, 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 what do you remember? Uh, and, uh, there's a lot of, a lot of options. So I appreciate everybody, uh, uh, helping us out with that deal. Much, much appreciated. Boys and girls, thanks for tuning in. Appreciate all your support. So check out our sponsors. Check out adfreeshows.com. Check out jrsbbq.com. And be sure to check us out next week. We're back talking all things No Mercy 2002. Right here on Grilling JR with the voice of wrestling, Mr. Jim Ross. And don't give up on my Sooners. Sooner than later, pun intended, we'll be just fine. Thanks, everybody. For the record, the answer was, was fingers, right? Jim. What? You'd rather have penis fingers than vagina ears, right? We'll talk about it next week. We'll see you next week, folks. Because of the legend of the villanos that started approximately 1970, he brought that legacy that the villanos with the mask will endure for years. They, They are one of the beloved families of Mexico. And Villano Fourth uh, has proven through those first two chapters, wow, what a war with LA Park in Monterey and what a war with Psycho Clown. For him to go into the ring with Pentagon Junior, Pentagon Junior will have to perform at the highest level if he wants to remain a masked luchador. I see Villano Cuatro, Villano Fourth, stronger. I believe that he has gotten that 
like new life, like uh, you see his eyes and he wants that moment. For Villano Cuatro to go into Arena Ciudad de Mexico on October 15 and defeat uh, Pentagon Junior, it's gonna be something fantastic for the chapter of the Villano's legacy. Monterrey, first chapter, Triple Mania, or second chapter, Tijuana. This is it, this is for all the marbles. One mask will fall on October 15, Arena Ciudad de Mexico, Triple Mania. And if you haven't bought your ticket and it's still left ticket, grab one, because this is a once in a lifetime occasion. Villano Cuatro, right now, he's got that edge. And a veteran like him, you give him just a little edge, He'll take you down. Your mask will come off.